Good afternoon, Prinhan Tarpav. I'm Oriel Miller. I'm the director of the IWA. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, you're very welcome. And for those of you who know us well, you're also very welcome. We are Wales's leading independent think tank with a long track record of shaping debates and influencing change in Wales through our policy research and advocacy, our online and print publication. Here's the latest edition, edition of the Welsh Agenda. The next one will be out at the end of April. And they provide platforms for robust comment and debate as well as our agenda setting event. We're a membership organization with members right across the country and much further afield. Um, and we're funded by our members, the events we run ourselves and independent trusts and foundations. Today's event is the latest in our partnership with Cardiff University and we're also grateful to Cardiff City Council for their support too. Thank you both. A little bit of housekeeping before we get stuck in. As this is a Zoom webinar, you as participants are muted by the host and we're going to use the Q&A section uh, at the bottom of your screen for questions. If you'd like to direct your question to a particular panelist, do please uh, say so in, when, when you pose it. We really encourage you to engage with each other in the chat. Please note that all chat and questions are recorded and the hashtag for today's event is hashtag IWA debate. Okay. Today's event, today we're talking about mobility in our fast growing city and the big question of what the future of transport should look like for the Cardiff capital region. People are more conscious than ever of the impact of different modes of transportation on the climate, on nature and on people's health and well-being. But of course, in a busy region like Cardiff, people will ultimately still need to get from A to B which has led to radical debates into whether the way in which we've been building and investing over the past few decades is, reason, is really a sustainable or indeed desirable model for our future generations. If we want people to make good, in inverted commas, choices about how they travel, we must make it easy for them to do so. Last week, Welsh Government published their 10-year transport strategy, which has at its heart a focus on increasing public transport use and active travel while reducing transport emissions. This is a progressive move for Wales and has been driven by Wales' ambition to reach net zero by 2050. However, small and large P politics still lie at the heart of the decarbonisation debate and its implications for transport. Ahead of the 2021 Senate elections coming up in just over six weeks time in early May, Welsh Labour have pledged to create a Wales with a greener future, Plaid Cymru to ensure Wales is carbon neutral by 2035, and the Welsh Conservatives have committed to solving congestion issues through building more roads. Like all aspects of the transition to a clean, green and fair economy, reforming transport needs to happen in a way which does not exclude people, but includes them, which contributes to prosperity, and which strengthens support for the move to net zero. We need to take people with us. I'd encourage you all to take a look at the report published this week from IPPR's South Wales Valley's Climate Citizens Jury, which I know Christine was an advisor to. One key comment from a juror was that we shouldn't punish anyone for where they live. So benefits and subsidies are better than sanctions and penalties. An important principle for our panel to ponder a little later. This citizens jury clearly shows the depth of public support for green measures that can be unlocked by policymakers but only if we get this right. As we transition through and gradually out of the pandemic and towards the new normal, we know that the solutions to the challenges we faced before the pandemic may not be the same, probably won't be the same. For those of us fortunate enough to have been able to continue working over the last year, and for those of us who've been doing that from home too, we have seen for better or worse, what life is like in a world with less travel. No commuting, getting to know the places we live a little better, spending more locally, perhaps spending more unrushed time with our families. On the other hand, the blurring of lines between work and home, steep drops in revenues for public transport, screen burn from endless Zooms. So perhaps the steady state post COVID will be a world where we don't travel as much as we used to, but we will still need sustainable transport networks to be there when we do need them and when we all need them. Today's discussion will explore how we get there and how we balance these competing priorities. On our panel, we have Mark Barry, Professor of Practice in Connectivity at Cardiff University, Councillor Hugh Thomas, Leader of Cardiff City Council, Christine Boston, Director of Sustrans Cymru and Chair of Transform Cymru, and Alison Dutois, Architect, Urban Designer, 
designer, educator at UW Bristol and Gail. Welcome to you all. Mark, I think we're going to hear from you first, please, on the challenges and opportunities for Cardiff Capital Region over the next five years. And then we'll move into a discussion after that. So while you're getting your screen ready, fantastic. Here we go. So I, I assume you can all see that. Thank you, Oriel, for the introduction. Um, and thanks for the invite. Um, I've got 20 minutes to get through quite a bit of stuff. Um, and I apologize because I'm going to be slightly provocative uh, in relation to some of the content. But just to, if people don't know me, I've, I've had background in, I guess, Transport, Metro, Cardiff Council's white paper, the recent publication of the Cardiff Capital Region Rail Vision, and I've had a hand in all of that. So I, I think I've got a really good, I guess, emotional and pragmatic view of what we think uh, we need to do in the next 10, 15 years, especially post-COVID. I want to cover, first of all, a bit of a, a view of climate change and what that means. Um, and I'm going to be very provocative about cars. Um, and some people might not like some of that, but I think it's a conversation we need to have. Then look at the impact of COVID, working from home, uh, the impact of all of that on how we think about transport planning and what that means for Cardiff and the Cardiff Capital Region and for Welsh Government. So first of all, we've got a, I think most of us are aware now, we've got a major problem globally. Uh, climate change is real, it's happening, we are causing it, and we need to do something. And, and the other kind of counter to that in terms of transport mobility, Pre-COVID, 80% of people commuted in their cars. Um, public transport was a very, very low mode share, you know, sort of 10, 12% and active travel, uh, a similar number. We've got a real serious issue in that we are over-dependent upon cars. And you can see that bottom right graph. Uh, instead of 1950s, that wasn't the case. So in the last sort of 60 years, we've built our lives around cars. We also now have legally binding decarbonisation targets for governments around the world. And Welsh government have got a target by 2030 to reduce their emissions compared to 1990 by 45% before they hit the 80% target in 2050. Um, I think a couple of years ago, they were about 28, 29%. So we're on the way, but a long way to go. And if you look at the sectors and their contributions to carbon emissions uh, and greenhouse gases, the, the, the sector that's had the least impact in terms of change in that period is transport. It, it, it's had only less than, I think, 4% lower than 1990, which is a big issue. And if you look across Europe, uh, transport emissions have actually gone up, um, which is a problem. And when you look at transport itself, the biggest component of transport emissions are, is car use. Um, and, and cars are 60% of transport, overall emissions, maybe 15%. It's a huge contribution. And it's something we need to seriously look at in terms of our use of cars, if we're going to begin to deliver those legally binding targets. So let's talk about cars. And, and some of you will have seen these slides before, but I like to repeat them. And I always ask people, what do you notice when I show you that picture? And everyone says, loads of cars. And I say, well, look again, what do you really notice? And what you really notice is loads of cars actually doing nothing, actually sat there motionless. Thousands and thousands, millions of cars around the world spend most of their time doing absolutely nothing. What a grossly inefficient waste of natural resources and energy to produce such an inefficient mobility system. And we've now got a big problem in that. We've designed our cities around cars more when they're not moving than when they are, which I think is a huge problem, given that most of our inner cities were designed before cars existed. Uh, and now we've filled our streets with pieces of metal. We know that the carbon emissions from cars are a huge contributor to, to global emissions. But I'd also point out and begin to explain and, and convey the, the, the further external damaging costs of car use. In the UK, every year, there are 160,000 road accidents. 23,000 or so serious injuries require an ICU treatment. 1,700 facilities, uh, fatalities. That's five a day on average, and one cyclist every day gets killed in the UK. If the railways did that, then you close them down. We become desensitized to, to cars. And that's before you consider particulate emissions, the, the use of you know tires and, and get rid of, of old tires. It's a massive problem. Um, but this wasn't always the case. You look at Cardiff, you know, 100 or so years ago, we had a tram network around most of the city centre and all the valleys were covered at least two railway lines. We had a metro 100 years ago. Um, but what, of course, happened is in the period, especially post Buchanan um, and, and Moses in the US, we basically became completely enthralled by the car, which seemed to provide liberty and freedom, but at a huge cost that at that time we weren't aware of. And Cardiff was lucky because in the early 1970s, the oil price crash put pay to a lot of road schemes that would have actually destroyed much more of the, of the centre of Cardiff than was actually the case. So we did dodge a bullet, but actually the, the, the scene was set in the 1960s and 70s in terms of our prevalence for car. 
And what that's led us to is today, we have huge numbers of developments, houses, offices, hospitals, retail, that can only be accessed using the car. We've actually built in more and more car use, which again, as I said, has, has had massive environmental impacts. And it's something we've seriously got to grapple with so we can start to decouple ourselves from what I call, and I, I use this word unadvisedly, the heroin of car use. We become addicted to cars in a very dangerous way. I'm not anti-car, I'm anti the fact they are so all pervasive in our society. And there's talk of you know, autonomous vehicles and you know, automation. Um, the data in the US on services like Uber and Lyft that could be automated is that they're adding to congestion. So we have to be very careful not to be kind of taken in by illusory technologies that, 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 that I guess pretend to solve problems. Elon Musk and his tunnels, you know, they're not gonna solve the basic geometry of mobility in terms of the number of people who need to move and how efficient it is to move them. And that the truth is, if we're not careful, we just carry on building more roads uh, and inducing demand. This is something I came to quite late, understanding the dynamics of induced demand. If you build more road space, unless you provide fiscal disincentives, it will fill up. You will create more congestion. You can't remove congestion, you just move it around. And for the M4, for example, it's only 10 to 20% of peak time traffic that causes 100% of congestion. We already have enough road space. What we need are alternatives and measures to discourage unnecessary car use. And if you, I'll, I'll share this slide so that after, there's a really good video, which is a good explainer for induced demand. And it's worth looking at because it really makes simple this kind of fundamental issue we have with um, the need to build more road space. There's also going back to the point about utilization and um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation did some work a few years ago just trying to look at how useful um, cars are in terms of utilization. And you can see there's a huge amount of energy and resource and money put into something that spends less than 5% of its time being useful. If you run a business and your capital employee was you know, utilized less than 5%, as a manufacturing director, you would get sacked. But we've become used to this because we don't factor in the external costs, the huge amount of energy and resource used to produce cars. And um, we're basically letting ourselves off the hook in terms of our obligations to the planet. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I want to say that. There's plenty of academic evidence from around the world. The DFT have done a huge amount of work on induced demand and published data, which they don't make a huge amount of noise about. But anyone who's serious about transport planning and looking at the wider cost of car use have identified at least 30% of external cost, often multiples more than that, depending on who you, whose research you look at. We have got to start to apportion those external costs if we're going to start changing our behaviors. Quickly on electric vehicles, you know, I'm a big fan of, of green and our energy sources and using renewables. But again, people talking about electric vehicles and charging points as if that's going to solve our problems. Let's go back to basic principles. The idea of putting batteries in cars is in principle a good idea. You know, you remove the some of the, the noxious chemicals being spewed into our streets, but it's still power and it's still energy and it still needs to be produced. And the idea that we're going to have millions of charging cars you know, fed by cables draped over front gardens through front room windows using a 240 volt supply is, frankly, I think, crazy. Uh, we've got to change the model before we electrify it. And I think people need to be a bit more innovative. Now, one of the things I've noticed in the last couple of years is the innovation in batteries. Um, one of the challenges with batteries, of course, is energy density and the size of the battery you need to charge a vehicle. And obviously, the heavier the vehicle, um, the more energy you need. But there are uh, companies now in, in India looking at small, lighter vehicles, which you can use battery stations where you can swap batteries out in and out in a matter of seconds. The problem we have, of course, is we have a world now where cars are getting bigger and the greenwash in, of the car industry is making bigger cars, calling them EV SUVs, but they require more energy to build, to move. And any benefits we get from battery technology is negated by the fact we need more energy to move these things. The reality is we need smaller vehicles. The other thing we've got to deal with as well, the car industry is now not interested in selling cars so much as in financial service products. We now have cars with built-in obsolescence sold under leases where you pay 200, 300 pounds a month where you're offered the ability to get a new car perhaps every three years. So we're building in the production of more cars because of obsolescence built into the vehicles and the financial service products. And this is not the answer. Uh, and there's a greenwash in the car industry that is really, really not helping our ultimate goal and need to reduce carbon emissions. So the reality is I support electric vehicles, but only if we have fewer and smaller vehicles first. 
And for me, the idea of providing, you know, charging points all over Wales for Tesla drivers is missing the point. The point is we need fewer cars. And if we don't get our heads around that, we are not going to solve this problem and deal with our decarbonisation targets. Quickly on COVID, um, you know, the world has changed. And we were talking earlier, it's been a year since we've been locked in. Um, so I think there's a couple of observations I'd make. Um, again, assertions, and people can challenge this. Uh, clearly, we don't all need to be in an office, most of us, from nine to five, Monday to Friday. The perversity of our transport systems is that they're designed to move people in huge numbers twice a day in one direction. Um, this peak time need you know, adds hugely to infrastructure costs and means poor utilization over the full day, adding to costs and subsidies. If we can flatten that curve, then that would be hugely beneficial to transport providers. But I think what we realize is nobody wants to work or most people don't want to work home all the time. So I do think there's an opportunity for the more blended existence because we are, I think, maybe some of us at risk of suffering the illusion of productivity through all of these meetings we're having online. But let's not forget, you know, with young people starting a job, spontaneity, innovation, creativity, the need to have a robust discussion with your colleagues is much better than face to face. So it is about blend. So I still think we need offices and headquarters, but we can actually spend maybe some more time at home and more time in local work hubs. But going back to the point I made earlier, you know, given the car mode shed is over 80 percent and we have an absolute need from planning terms to start relocating our shed based offices, our shed based retail, especially food retail back to town and city centres. The reality is we are going to need a lot more public transport aligned with active travel and public transport. We can't get away from that. Um, and I think the argument is now, oh, we've got COVID, we don't need Metro, which I've heard, is really rather naive. The issue we've got and the opportunity we've got is to reduce car use, along with more flexible working and planning changes. And just to kind of focus the conversation, I think the biggest challenge we've got is in transport modelling and transport planning. Anyone who's been involved in a five-case model uh, and transport appraisal knows that much of the quantitative numbers that are produced come out of value of time which actually favours road building and, and disincentivise public transport. Because I say most of the external costs of road building are external and don't get properly counted in transport appraisal. Most of the external costs are actually not cost of public transport, they're benefits, and they don't get costed in transport appraisal, which leads to a disproportionate favour of investing in roads rather than in public transport. So there's a real issue in our appraisal systems. When you add to that the decarbonisation targets and then recently published Welsh uh, Government Transport Strategy, we need a different approach. So what happens today is a transport planner would sit at the left of that screen, pump in, you know, inputs, the services, the frequency, the capacity, the price, press some buttons and then come up with a kind of a, a long term trend in terms of change of demand for that transport service that we're planning. Now, this has worked quite well, although I say it's been hugely constrained by our transport appraisal failings in terms of value of time. But what we need to do now is turn it on its head. The transport planning world we need now needs not to plan or predict the future, it needs to define the future. The decarbonisation target needs us to model scenarios of what mode share we require to deliver that and then work back to determine what the inputs are. So my kind of challenge, and I know that many uh, transport authorities are grappling with this, it looks like we may need to cut car use from 80% to less than 40%. That infers a need to treble public transport. It needs a massive increase in active travel in urban areas. And so what we need to do is model those scenarios and look at what the inputs should be. And the inputs for me are five things. One is we need to try and embed more flexible working in what we do. So we work at an office some of the time, not maybe nine to five, at home some of the time for those who can and want to, and locally where that's possible. We do need a lot more public transport and active travel. We do need a very, very strong planning line to put stuff back in town and city centres all over Wales, all over the valleys, in communities in Cardiff. You know, we've lost our food retail and it's, it's basically stuck in car parks or motorway junctions. That has to go back. We do need smaller, lighter electric vehicles that maybe in some cases are more shared. So there's more of a utility there, but we've got to reduce the number. And the fourth point there, which I think is the most politically challenging, which we need to get to, is that we need demand management measures. One of those is space. So we reduce road space to force people in the best possible way onto other modes. And that's why I support the, the decarbonisation of Castle Street to only allow buses and active travels through there. We have to send a message that roads aren't for cars, they're for other things as well. But the most challenging conversation is going to be on road pricing. Now, if you look around the plans that Cardiff Council have produced and the Cardiff Capital Region have produced and what's government are working on, there's a really good 
set of proposals that we can look to try and implement over the next 15 years across the Cardiff Capital Region. That's things like cross rail, improving the, the, the valley's lines to, to Ebba Valley and, and my stake. You know, we've got the plans and we've got the proposals. We haven't got the funding in some cases. As I say, in Cardiff, the white paper has set out a really strong lead on the use of active travel and public transport in the city to reduce car use to, in the city to maybe 20 to 30%, which I think is perfectly possible and desirable. But I'm gonna leave on this. The real challenge we've got is, is given all those external costs, it's not just decarbonization of mobility, it's actually reducing all the other damage, the induced demand, the sprawl, the air quality, the fact that our roads are dangerous to actually to walk on, the road traffic accidents. We need to bring in road pricing and whether we like it or not, officials in government at Westminster are, are thinking about this because the fuel duty associated with diesel cars is in rapid decline because of electric vehicles. The opportunity now is to use that momentum to bring in something that more fairly apportions the cost of car use to car users. And I don't think that should be ubiquitous for everybody. Those that need to drive need discounts. In rural areas, you need not pay so much or anything at all. The biggest benefits in urban areas where there are actually real alternatives to car use. And I'll just finish on my personal experience. I live two miles from the centre of the Cardiff. Until about five years ago, I had a car and drove everywhere. And one day I thought, what am I doing? I'm driving to places I don't need to. I can actually walk, I can cycle, I can get a bus. I sold my car to charity because webuyanycar.com offered me only £34. Nothing had to change in the world around me. I went through a kind of a Damascian conversion that realised, I realised that I could actually make other choices. And the biggest benefit we're going to have is getting more people to realise you can make many more journeys in urban areas without using a car. Yes, build the public transport. Yes, let's put the active travel in. But a lot of this is down to individual choice and just explaining and explaining how damaging cars have been to our societies over the last 50 years. And we've got to change that. And if we don't change that, we're never going to hit those decarbonisation targets. And I think as an intro, I'll leave that there, Oriel, that's okay. Great, thank you very much indeed, Mark. So Hugh, I'm gonna to come to you next because Mark set out some really good challenges around our addiction to cars. Uh, the point being that we need fewer cars, obviously. Um, the, the opportunity for um, policymakers to define rather than predict the future. And we'll come back to that as well, because I know one of the things that's been redefined lately has been the, the scale of growth in the population of Cardiff, which I'm sure will come up in the conversation shortly. Um, issues around road pricing, we're going we're gonna to quiz you all on, on that too. But also, crucially, that public conversation, how to involve the public in that conversation and enable people and support people to make different choices, perhaps, perhaps also for different life stages. So, Hugh, from, from your perspective, how is Dark Cardiff going to meet the challenge that Mark has, has set out? What are your plans for those of us who have not read the, the white paper? And yes, I have actually. <laughs> Very good, uh, Oriel. Uh, I, I, if you haven't read it, then I would encourage you to read it. It's obviously published uh, just over a year ago. And um, whilst there is certainly a sense that the world has changed in the last 12 months, I think some of the fundamental problems that we were grappling with in terms of transport uh, continue to be, to be the same and, and, and you know the, the evidence that, that uh, Mark has, has presented there um, kind of re reinforces that. It's very interesting actually when you look at some of the um, modal splits data um, that we have um, you know for, for, pe for people's behaviours during the pandemic and, and what we're seeing in Cardiff is that um, uh, car journeys has largely stayed stable, um, stable increase actually uh, there's been a significant noticeable increase uh, in, in active travel modes uh, but a real collapse uh, in the use of, um, of public transport, um, bus, bus and train. And, and that's no surprise because for um, significant periods of the last 12 months, you've had government ministers um, go on TV and tell people to avoid using public transport because um, not, not considered safe to do so in the, in the context of the pandemic. So there is a, a huge rebuilding uh, uh, issue um, that, that he's doing in terms of rebuilding public trust in uh, the public transport network and, and its safety, but also in terms of actually building up its capacity again. Uh, and I would certainly will commend um, what the Welsh Government have done in the last uh, 12 months with their um, BEZ schemes to support the bus industry uh, in, in particular. Um, but I think let's, let's also recognise, and we've, we've talked about working from home and, and, and all the rest of it. Actually, if you're able to work from home, 
you're you're probably very privileged uh, in being able to do that uh, because there are a huge number of jobs still and they're more likely to be low paid jobs um, that you fundamentally have to go out uh, and, and and do on the front line you can't you can't do you know on on, on your sofa on, on a laptop and as we know um, the the more um, the less affluent uh, you you are um, the more likely you are to be unable to afford a car uh, and we've got some really really strong data showing the correlation in terms of Cardiff uh, between um, car ownership and the the, the wealth of, of an area. So, so the wealthier areas have got far higher levels of, 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 um, of car ownership. So I, I think it's really important for policymakers to uh, not sort of think, well, there is reduced demand, uh, you know, because more people are working from home, so we need to invest less uh, in, in public transport. And on that basis, um, I think that the, the plans that we put forward in that transport white paper, you know, proposals like uh, a Cardiff Crossrail, whereby you have um, you know, a tram train solution coming down from the northwest of Cardiff, re really beyond from, from Ponta Clean, down to um, Cardiff Central train station, and then down through, through the bay, out on the uh, industrial lines through Splot and beyond and connect to the new parkway in St. Mellons, a, a city line um, connecting, uh, you know, rebuilding the line through Corriton and connecting across the river to Rada and supported then by uh, a much denser, uh, more networked uh, bus, uh, uh, series of bus routes and um, superlative cycle infrastructure, which, you know, is, is actually been accelerated through the, through the pandemic. We think the case for that um, is, is a strong forever. The fundamental question um, is around how do you fund it? And, you know, uh, we, we'll, we'll come on to talking more detail about road, road user charging. But the reason why we put that on the agenda is to start you know, a very serious conversation about the need um, you know, to, to find new ways of unlocking financing and, and picking up on, on Mark's point that there is a, an inbuilt subsidy currently for, for car users. Um, but it's not the, the only game in town, certainly. And, and we're also exploring other innovative models, you know, tax incremental finance, uh, for example, as a means of unlocking specific uh, infrastructure developments. So there is an awful lot to do. I think there, there needs to be an appreciation as well that the, the council can set uh, a, a vision and set, set its um, you know, ideal vision of what, of what the city uh, and the city region needs to look like. There are other partners in, involved here as well. Welsh Government, uh, Network Rail, up to a point, the Regional Transport Authority. Um, and you know, I, think, I think we all recognise when it comes to rail in particular, um, we, we, we don't seem to be able to do things quickly um, in this country. And that's, that's a source of huge frustration uh, for myself, I have to say. So you know, we as a council are pushing, um, we need others to, to push on as well. Um, there's a load I could say about kind of the, the political considerations, particularly when it comes to road space, but I'll pause there, Aurel, and maybe we'll, well, we'll come I, I back. Want, thank you. Well spotted on the not doing things fast on the rail front. Uh, sharp eyes prize to you, Hugh, on that one. Um, I guess picking up on the political thing, what do you see as a potential political risk to you or any council that we're going to prioritise sustainable transport solutions that are potentially unpopular now? Because because that shift and that and that shift of both public trust in terms of uh, public transport, but also the boosting the capacity. There's a there's a timing phase there, isn't there? When when funding may not necessarily be on stream, so there's a there's a there's a lag. That's a that's a big ask, isn't it? Well, look, you only have to read a handful of um, of Facebook comments, um, like I've been uh, silly enough to do on, on on one or two occasions to see. Um, the, the strength of feeling there is um, on, on, on issues like this, particularly when it comes to uh, changing uh, road use. And, and it's because it's something everybody has a stake in. Um, but, but I would certainly say that there are, you know, there's been a strong reaction, positive and negative to, um, you know, the, the, the current position on, on Castle Street and, and the closure there. You know, I, I, I went there um, during the summer when we had the, um, the tables and chairs out. I thought it was unbelievable, I have to say, as, as, a, as an urban environment that blended the city centre with the castle uh, in, a, in a safe space. But, but others are, are very angry um, that you can't drive a, drive a car down there now. Likewise, on, on Wellfield Road, and um, you know, I, I posted on Twitter um, last month, taking my 18-month-old boy on the back of my bike, cycling up that route, 
um, in, in a now segregated cycle way. A again, um, you know, very safe in terms of cycle infrastructure. Um, we've, we've removed a, a lane of uh, car traffic there generally well liked by uh, by the residents around there from from what i can tell um but the comments on, on on social media are all about why are you making it harder for people to drive around the city um, and I, wonder from I wonder if that's partly you know it's more it's more acceptable to people who do use different modes of travel whereas if you use predominantly only one mo mode you'll feel much more strongly about it let's let's pick up on that in a minute i'm going to come back to um I'm just teeing you up now, uh, Hugh, because I know there's a question from Gethin Reese, which is about Cardiff's proposal for road charging, which exempts residents of Cardiff. Does it make um, any sense given Mark's presentation? So when we come back to that public char charging conversation, I'm coming to you with that one. But first of all, Christine, how do you feel um, about these challenges that Mark uh, has set out? Do you, do you agree with them? What do you see as the solution to them? Um, is Cardiff Council going far enough? Yeah, I think you know, Mark is quite right about setting up the challenges and, you know, agree with everything that he said in his presentation. Um, I think there's a huge risk that we will see a car led recovery from COVID um, and, and that's a, a significant uh, concern for us. And I think it's a matter of, you know, somehow the car feels safe. Um, but the car isn't safe at all, you know, apart from the fact that it's polluting our atmosphere, you know, it causes a significant number of accidents, so around 2,000 deaths a year through road traffic accidents, and about 25,000 seriously injured, you know, and I'm sure there's a, a range of other types of injury categories as well. Um, so, you know, they're not safe for lots of reasons, of course, yeah, if you get hit by one or your child does, they're not going to come out with that particularly well. So, um, you know, that's one aspect, but I think the challenges around changing people's car dependence are going to be around capacity on public transport. That's a significant concern right now. Um, evidently, at the moment, you know, a train from Merthyr can only carry about 28 people um, into Cardiff, and that two metre social distancing is likely to be in place for at least another 12 months. So you know, what does that mean for capacity? That's a long time for people to have changed their habits. And what does it mean in terms of access as well? Because, um, you know, I think that there's a significant danger that we're going to be making transport unaffordable for more people, um, which will then increase social exclusion and increase poverty. Um, because the cost of public transport, if passengers have gone down, you know, there's the potential that costs are going to have to go up. Um, so will that make it unaffordable? Uh, and for people, you know, is there going to be a guarantee that they can get on? And then the cost of electric vehicles as well. Um, you know, they are, they're expensive and not everyone is going to be able to afford them. So if that's what we um, are moving to, I think there's a greater risk of exclusion. And I know, Oriel, you mentioned before about the IPPI report that was launched yesterday, and there was a particular quote that stood out for me, and, and this is exactly how I ended up working in transport poverty. I was living in the valleys, I could see the issues, I was working on gender equality, I could see the issues facing carers, you know, women who were trying to get children to nursery and get themselves to work. Um, and if they don't have a car and they're less likely to have a car and drive um, than men are, you know, so the, the quote from the IPPR work was from a woman in um, the valleys saying one of the walls I face as a woman with a young family is being able to get my children to school on time and then travel to one of the bigger cities, so Cardiff or Swansea, to work and get there on time, making public transport an impossible option. And this is the challenge, you know, we need to ensure that a transport network works for everybody and is inclusive for everyone. So there's some conversations about who's involved in those in those discussions about what works, what works for them. So that might be something to come back to um, come back to you on Hugh later on. Um, do you think, do you think, I guess one of my questions to you, Christine, was is Cardiff Council going far enough? And what else do you think they could be doing? Because you've you've pulled out a number of different strings there. The capacity issue in the short term, there's kind of a short term um, period of time between now and what, I don't know, middle of next year, till we're going to have to social, you know, keep social distancing, um, rolling stock, you know, all those sorts of things. I, you know, I think Cardiff has done a fantastic job, you know, outstanding in the things that they've put in place, you know, in the rollout of active travel routes and created streets for people, um, you know, absolutely 
outstanding job. The car clubs, you know, I think are particularly brilliant. Um, I think, you know, if there was a point of improvement, it would be around accessible taxis and accessible cars in the car clubs um, that are wheelchair accessible and that uh, people with disabilities could use. You know, that, that's a thing that would definitely help to make uh, the provision more inclusive. I think the biggest challenge is getting the surrounding authorities to have the same ambition um, to feed in. You know, I live just outside Cardiff. I, I see it here. Um, I'm in the Vale of Glamorgan. Um, a lot of concentration on bypasses rather than improving public transport and active travel provision so that it can link into, um, into the great facilities that Cardiff has now. You've just answered my next question, which is going to be how can we ensure that the future sustainable transport system is inclusive? So you've talked about accessible accessible taxis and car shares in particular. I think, you know, from the point of view, your, you, your point is well made around poverty and exclusion as well, and the, gen, the very gendered aspects of, of that. Um, I don't think I have answers for that, but that's, some, I guess the question, you know, I, what I'm wondering is who's keeping, who's keeping tabs on who's involved in those conversations? Because one of the things we have seen, obviously, throughout the last year, is how communities in all sorts of different ways and placing places are really um, well positioned to respond to the challenges that they face. You know, they know the solutions that will suit them. And we've also seen from the IPPR work this week that there is an appetite for going further in terms of in, in terms of the green agenda. So building on both of those, what what role do you think people can have in shaping the future of mobility in the Cardiff capital region? And what, what kind of challenge would, would you like to set to, to bringing that to life? I think um, the first thing for me would be around increasing diversity in the people who are involved in transport planning and delivery. Um, because, you know, the focus is on A to B journeys and that they are the types of journeys that may, men tend to make more of. You know, we know that women are more likely to be trip training. They're making journeys A to B to C to D. And they need a service that uh, provides for that. Um, so, you know, more better representation of um, the communities that we serve in transport planning and delivery, that would be my number one thing in making a difference for this. Um, more engagement with those with protected characteristics, understanding what it is that they need, um, commitment to access. So as I've already said, around accessible taxis and cars, making sure there's plenty available. And then on the active travel side, a commitment to the removal of barriers on the national cycle network because at the minute um, an adapted bike can't get through the access barriers and actually an e-cargo bike couldn't get through the access barriers, you know, and so um, we need to see those things removed um, to create more opportunities for people. That's, uh, yeah, that's a good point, well made. So a challenge, a practical challenge straight away there to, to follow up on. And I can certainly relate as a mum of three children to that kind of, if I'm going out, I'm gonna do a number of things on the way and I'm gonna plan my route in a way that means I can pick up something from the pharmacy, nip in and get something else on the way and while picking up a child and walking the dog, preferably at the same time. Um, interesting, thank you for that. Um, Alison, I'm gonna to come to you um, too next about, you know, obviously one, thing, one of the reasons we wanted you on the panel is your experience of working in lots of different cities across Europe. And we want to make sure that we look outwards constantly and think about what we can learn from elsewhere. You know, we can take the best examples from all sorts of different places. What do you think Wales can learn from elsewhere where we are now? Um, thank you. I, I think the, the big overarching thing, I'm gonna, I think all of what we've been speaking about is a lot of policy and Mark's given us a fantastic kind of umbrella and I want to look at now like the raindrops, you know, like we, we, we cannot only explain and tell people what they need to do. And the biggest lesson is, you know, nobody stopped smoking because the Surgeon General told them it was bad in the 60s. Um, you know, it's very hard to do things just on that. And in cities like Copenhagen, nobody's a cyclist. They're parents and students and they, there are other things. They, you know, we don't identify as cyclists, right? Um, unless we are, you know, a cyclist. And so I think we've got to think about um, how we change our culture and how we start to make these shifts. And I think the biggest lesson is, and the way that we're going to find um, a route not back to where we were, 
um, not back to, soon, to new normal. And in fact, a way of thinking about what do we do while we're waiting for the metro to come? And I think the biggest thing is we need to think about this, jumping on what you're just saying, this travel time, and, and to think about the journeys, and this is for everyone, and everyone is a pedestrian at some point in every journey. And most of us use many modes. And so we've got to start, you know, thinking about as we're making new places and as we're looking at that fantastic metro map, and as we're looking at Cardiff Central Square, and as we're looking at all these things, we've got to recognize that the bus station is not a place. It's a part of a journey. And we, start, we need to start thinking about these as physical places that we, we, we have people use, people have different needs. Um, we need to take a variety of equipment with us. You know, we come with a bike, we leave with a bike, we enter with a pram, we have shopping, you know, we, we have different mobilities. So these physical places need to serve our needs with lots of shops like you were just speaking about, you know, stopping at the pharmacy adjacent to the school, et cetera. They also need to be thought of as linked systems so that there's an ease of ticketing and ease of transfer. It's really direct. I should come out from one mode of transport and immediately see what I do to transfer to my next mode of transport. This linkage, this pricing, God knows we need linked up ticketing and pricing and things like that. These are the things which are the lessons from other places that help make all journeys multimodal. And we stop then thinking, well, I'm a cyclist, you're a busser, you know, and, and the equalization of society happens when we can all recognize ourselves in all modes. Uh, you know, the former mayor of Bogota said, uh, uh, Mr. Penuloso once said, you know you're in a wealthy city when everyone takes the bus. And you know you're in an impoverished place when the people who have no choice take the bus. And, and that's, where we're, that's what we're at risk of doing. And so we've got to think about making those stops and stations. And that involves, you know, thinking as Christine was saying, this, this amazing equity. So we've got to think about designing systems and places that work for the youngest and work for the oldest. We can't design for the 25 year olds or the 45 year olds. We've got to design so that our children can cross streets, can journey seamlessly on their way to schools to release that mother and father from having to drop the children off. So that the kids, like in most civilized countries, can walk to school from the age of seven on their own or six. And we've got to release it so that our elders can make those journeys safely. And that those places that we, we, we find ourselves, schools um, and our homes, are adequately linked to the types of services we want. So I think it's a coordination of systems and that kind of thing. And I think that's really about, you know, changing the perception around all of this from, from a trend, what, you know, we learned when we go out into like, when, when Copenhagen had to up its game, um, which it has from, you know, not when I first went to Copenhagen in 88 and thought, my God, it's cycling paradise. You know, what it's done since then is to up its game, to so move it away from, you know, a trend or activity to something that everybody is doing. And the tone of the communications, therefore, has to be about, not because it's convenient, not because it's cheaper, not because it's healthier, just because it's the most logical thing. And the way we get there is, you know, every time there's a drive crossing a pavement, it should be the other way. The pavement needs to cross and be absolutely continuous. So the driver has to stop the car and look for pedestrians, not the other way around. It has to happen at every secondary road. It has to happen so that every green light goes green first for people and cyclists and their journey time and the efficiency of their mode of traffic has to be at the top of that pyramid. And so those are things that I think that work and that starts to change the culture because once you start having that capacity in the system, you're really working from a quality driven way. And if you have the, you know, I'm not, you know, gosh, let's talk about how we get there with data and capacity of systems and things like that. But once we have that kind of, that's the level of communication that matters. If I can see across that road that I've got the priority and that my route is seamless and that I don't have to put up signs because the, the design of the system places the priority on the soft traffic first, um, then we start to see that that is the most convenient route and the children can walk to school, which means that the parent can 
do something else and we start to have that equity in the system. So I think there's a lot of a lot of that level of uh, getting away from a situation where we have to explain or tell people and, and start to recognize that we're, we're changing the cultures just as Copenhagen had to change its culture, just as Vancouver's changed its culture. Manhattan has changed its culture, you know? Um, so, you know, as Jan Gell would say, if, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. And, you know, they're cycling in Manhattan, my friends. So, um, that's the short answer. Okay, thank stop. you. I, no, that's great. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in this thing about around, around culture in, in particular. And I'm also wanting to just draw everybody's attention to a paper we published, oh, I think it was two, if not three years ago, looking at decarbonizing transport. And but we made the point very specifically about bus transport being seen as transport for poor people, people who have, who have no Absolutely. other choices. So um, if the IWA teams um, in the background could find a link to that on our website and put it in the chat, please, that'd be great. Interesting too about this, you know, perception from this is something that's a, tr that's a trend. This is logical and it's unarguable with wherever you sit from the point of view of, so that's a big public conversation there, isn't there? And, and, and culture change takes, takes time. Um, and we all know eat strategy for breakfast too. Um, so I guess if we're thinking about, you know, and if we're serious about treating COVID and this, this collective experience as an opportunity to put, to quickly put things in place that will re mean that the region is better connected once we do fully open up. What do you think you would advise Hugh now, Alison, and other lead leaders of city regions across Wales, you know, Swansea, um, and I'm thinking sort of the, the North Wales Ambition Board as well as the Mid Wales Growth Deal, but different in terms of urban populations. What would you advise you to put into place now and put in place quickly? I think building on some of the systems that are already there, you know, when I was, um, I, I think you need to take a lot of all of these vision documents and all these strategy documents and start to link them in and figure out where's the evidence and to give them some teeth so that the vision statements actually come with some criteria and some parameters um, that, that start to allow you to measure the criteria. And I think that it's um, matching those things across the different regions, if that makes sense. So that I think, I think there's a lot of capacity within the system, but I think that needs to be pushed out into a lot of the planning documents so that the you know, whenever there's a new development or whenever there's a new funding proposal, you're looking at it from the focal length of, so to speak, the soft traffic and the, the linkage of, if you can get people to walk into connect on cycles and things like that, then, then it works. We're really good at finding um, the efficiency within the car system because that's what we're used to. So we've, I think we've got to find a way to link all these documents with a, with a, with a, with a with a kind of a, a political agenda that puts it down to a, a, a different scale. And, and that's whether we're talking about green or health or access to education, whatever, because again, all of this transportation links into the green strategy, the carbon strategy, the business strategy, the health strategy, you know, the, the return to economic health, all of these things. Um, have links into how we how we manage active travel. So we, we need to get some data, I think, on it um, and some good parameters that we can start to judge what success looks like. Okay, let's let's think about that that data yeah. challenge there in the conversation. But I also want to come back to, you know, you've been clear about this behavior change that needs to mm. happen. Can you talk us through examples of how, where and how that's happened well? Because it's one thing to know it, yep. it's another thing to do it. Um, okay, so the story, it's a story, I'm sorry, some of you probably have heard it. I know Mark's heard it and Christine's heard it and I apologize, but so New York City Times Square, right? And the end joke on this, the punchline here is that there is no square in Times Square, but Times Square 80s was a place of prostitution and drugs. Uh, you move and crime it, it moves on from that. And in the 90s, you know, uh, uh, how are we going to make this better? We go, Gale Architects, we go and we do a big public life, public space study. We find out that in Times Square, 90% of the space is given over to road and 10% of the space is given over to pavement or sidewalks. When we do our quality of life study, we find out that 90% of the people who use the space 
are on the pavements and 10% of the people are in the vehicles. So 10% of the users are in 90% of the space. Mayor Bloomberg, at the time the mayor, a bazillionaire, businessman first and foremost, doesn't really care about quality of public space. He cares about his votes, right? 90% of your voters, Mr. Mayor, are crammed onto 10% of a really pretty rubbish space. And, you know, boom, that clicked. And, and, and he, in his office, had a countdown time for the three years that he had left in office when he, count, and when he hired us. He said, I got three years and I want to change this. And, and, and he said, don't talk to me about quality of public space. Don't talk to me about twee little dragons and hanging baskets. Talk to me about how I'm getting people safely to work. Talk to me about how I'm going to make the taxi drivers happy. And by shifting these priorities and linking the budgets and having the right kind of data, the voters right and the really strong unions of the taxis both were able to be happy because this the, the changes that we made because we had the data we're able to say gosh if we improve how people move then in fact we ended up you know decreasing pedestrian accidents etc cetera, etc cetera, but also increasing travel time by 17 percent so we because we had the right data and because we were actually looking at people as our unit of measure, so to speak, and our qualitative measure, that really held a ton of political goodwill. And it held on because then once you start to change that, it was a three month trial project to change Times Square over. And after three months, when you see that lease rates are going up and vacancy rates are going down and, and safety is going up, et cetera, et cetera, well, it becomes a no brainer to keep it. Um, so the culture starts to shift. And in fact, the funny thing about New Times Square then is later on it became, a, for the next mayor, it became a bit of a problem because suddenly you had ooh, topless dancers or you had you know unlicensed jugglers and things in the square. And we thought, what a great problem to have. People are using the space too well. And, so, and that's a much better problem. So the culture can change, right? But, if you provide the avenues. Great, great story for... Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Alison. So I want to know, Hugh, where your countdown clock is. If you move your if you move your screen, <laughs> have you got something just just off camera? And there's a very clear no dragons or hanging baskets thing for you for you there too. But with, with apologies, I say, I should have yeah. Careful on dragons, yeah. I know I um, do love dragon. When when we so let's come let's come to the political hot potato then in terms of the congestion charge. Does it really work? How does it impact on the rest of the region? Aren't you just um, slamming people coming from the valleys into, into Cardiff who are already having to travel for work, uh, experiencing the kinds of challenges that, that Chrissy has been setting out in terms of jobs and the, and the gendered nature of, um, of pickups, drop offs, school, um, balancing childcare? Is it going to price people out of Cardiff? And then the, 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 the question that I gave you um, earlier on, Hugh, was. Does, does the council's proposal for road charging, which exempts residents of Cardiff, make any kind of sense anymore if it ever did? And Gettin says that he's a resident of Cardiff and would be willing to pay. So thanks, Gettin, for, for being straight up about, about that. Let's, let's talk congestion charge, you. Well, thanks, Gethin. I'll, um, I'll put the address you can check anyway if you want to, if you want to make an, an upfront contribution. Um, where should I start? I mean, firstly, to re reiterate the point, um, uh, a road user charging model would be a tool to generate some of the revenue needed to finance the borrowing to, to deliver the, the vision set out in uh, in the transport white paper. It's not the only one, uh, but I think it's one that's worthy of consideration. Um, clearly, we've gone through uh, the, the pandemic since that paper was published, and I think probably you know that 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 behoves us to take a step back and look at what future. Um, uh, you know, congestion rates are going to be in terms of the, the, the level of transport. However, just to talk about some of the, some of the logic behind um, behind that proposal, when you look at uh, journeys made by Cardiff residents, this is, um, you know, a, as of January 2020, um, less than just under half of those journeys um, actually were done by car. 51% were done either, you know, by active travel modes or, uh, or by public transport. You compare that with um, the 100,000 people coming into Cardiff to work every day, uh, and 80% of those were doing so by car. So, um, you know, exactly along the lines, um, you know, that, that, that Mark was talking about in terms of 
um, behavior change, uh, th that is an area we think that is that is ripe for behavior change. With, we would be very clear, you know, the majority of the funding that will be raised by such a charge would actually be spent outside Cardiff, providing the infrastructure improvement, particularly uh, in, uh, in bus transports, that would enable people uh, to, to, to change their behaviours. But in terms of whether Cardiff residents should pay, um, our, our sense when we published the transfer paper was, was as follows. One, it is in the main Cardiff residents, particularly in the inner city, uh, who are uh, most badly affected by the negative consequences of, of, of congestion. You know, the particular matter, the poor air quality, um, the, the traffic driving through um, their, their neighbourhoods. And, and it's predominantly the inner city, poorer parts of, uh, of the city, you know, like, like where I live in Splot, uh, that, that are worst affected. Also, you know, in, in other parts of the city region, we're not asking people to pay to drive to the shops, to drive to their uh, local district centre to, you know, to, to visit the doctor. Um, and I don't think, therefore, it would be fair to uh, ask um, the, the residents of Cardiff to pay to do that. Um, but, but I come back to the fundamentally that the difference in the modal splits between commuters from without Cardiff coming in and how Cardiff residents, because of the high density in the city, because of the um, far better uh, as it stands, public transport network that, that exists within the city and you know, the active travel network that we are increasingly building, they are able already to uh, be far less reliant on a car. Um, now, there is a lot of road to run, I think, in terms of what happens with, uh, with road user charging. Um, you know, the Welsh Government have themselves uh, undertaken a study. I'm, I'm sure this is something that the UK Government is looking at as well, particularly in the context of uh, the declining revenue um, that's going to come through from um, vehicle tax. So, you know, wh whether this becomes a, a solution that's implemented on a, on a city level or more regionally or more nationally, I think, I think it's something that, that remains to be seen. The fundamental question I'm interested in, um, you know, which is a, a one to, to also ask um, government, is how are, how are we going to be able to deliver um, and afford the infrastructure um, our research shows Cardiff needs uh, to succeed uh, as a city, you know, in, into the future of the 21st century. Let's uh, let's pick up on that funding question in a tick. But Christine, can I come to you about this congestion charge um, and your point of view on it, please? Thanks, Oriel. I mean, we welcome um, we welcome things that will disincentivise car use um, and certainly support that. But in terms of a uh, congestion charge, there need to be alternatives in place first. And that is that includes, you know, the surrounding authorities. They've really got to link into what Cardiff is trying to do. Um, Sustrand's position on it is that there isn't enough research on how this sort of scheme can be introduced equitably um, and what that looks like. Um, and yeah, you know, pointing back to the example I gave earlier of that mother who, you know, just didn't think public transport was for her because she can't, you know, get to the places she needs to go um, and be in work on time. Um, you know, it's those sorts of people are most probably working part time in low paid roles um, because that's the only way they can manage work and care. Um, so, yeah, you know, it just we have to be sure that it can be delivered equitably, but completely support the aims. Um, but that's, you know, a detail that really needs to be considered in more depth. And I think in terms of the Welsh Government's uh, report that I think Caro shared yesterday, there is a little bit on equity in there, but a very, very tiny piece. You know, the report is about the concept in general, but there needs to be something specific done on that before any proposals could be taken forward. So a greater focus on, on issues around equity and, and voice. Mark, I'm going to come to you because there's a question here from Ken Barker, which is plans to charge to enter a cleaner air zone in the city centre seem clear. But do you think that the council should go further with a city-wide road or parking charge? I'll start by kind of trying to remove the word congestion charge. Um, I view this as reducing the discount for car use. That's, what I, that's how I frame this, because we're, I'm paying for people to drive because of all the external costs. Why am I subsidising that huge inefficient mobility choice that others make at my cost? So I'm actually, no, I, I want to stop paying so the discount is reduced. That's how I want to frame this, right? It's not a charge. It's a reduction of the discount. And how we do that, 
we have to think about equity, as has been raised. We have to think about operational efficiency and fairness, and I guess deliverability and operational practicalities. So the principle is about reducing the discount. Let's let's talk about that first. And then I think you know we, we've gone through COVID and Cardiff quite bravely. And another thing I think for politicians, politicians get blamed for everything and thanked for nothing. That is a solid life. But I'd never be a politician, frankly. I can say what I want; it doesn't really matter. But you know, if you're going to it be does elected, matter, Mark, but I take your point. Yeah, it's, it's going to be very careful. And we have, this conversation is happening with officials because there's a reality to this that's unavoidable given the decarbonisation targets. The challenge is how do we come up with a, a proposals that are, that are fair, that are equitable, that challenge some politicians who are more resistant with the evidence and the data. And we do have to be careful. We don't have people who need to use their cars shouldn't be prohibitively charged for having to do so. It's about targeting where we can have the most impact and have the most results in terms of mode share. There's an issue across the region, Cardiff put his chin out there and basically the Valley authorities threw their punch in, right? And Cardiff stood up and is, is saying, come on, bring it on. And I think that's what we need to get to. We need some robust discussions and the mechanisms we can use, we could price the use of a vehicle, there's car parking. We provide a huge amount of free car parking, right? That just says, please drive to me and park your car in me. That's not helping, you know? And so, you know, I put parking tax. And I, again, go back to the alternative. It's, it's a real tough place when we've depreciated our public transport capacity for the last 50 years to provide an alternative quickly enough to justify those kind of things. But I'm not a politician. I can just say we should do ABC. We need to work these things through. And there's no perfect answer. There's no panacea, no easy solution. But we've got to start moving in that direction and not in that direction. And that's going to be quite difficult, but we have to do it. So I, I like your idea about, about uh, reframing what the issue is. It feels as though we need a kind of people say this, what we need people to think about is that kind of transliteration or translation of what those, what those things are and to, and to socialize that in public, com in public conversation. I guess my, my challenge to Hugh and, and, your, and your team is um, how that framing of the public conversation is happening in a way that, that it, both it lands well and people grip it and say, oh yeah, I never thought of it like, I never thought of it like that. And Christine, you know, your point around the costs that are built into the, the um, calculations of what's, what's measured, there's so many other costs that aren't, uh, aren't evidence in there because they are further removed. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an opportunity cost in that communication of it too. Um, we've got loads of questions coming in, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to one next from Neil Harris. Um, and who's asking, where's the greatest gain in sustainable transport as a Cardiff, Cardiff capital region, with a focus on region, focusing on interurban transport or intra-urban transport? And Mark, I guess that's one for you first, okay. and then I'll see where else we take it after that. I think, if you, let's, let's split that. If you look at Cardiff, Cardiff is, you know, a quarter of the, the population in South East Wales. A lot more journeys can be made with active travel, simply put. Um, and, just encouraging that, making that easier. If you look at the wider region and that, if we call that inter-regional connectivity from Merthyr across, you know, to Ebervale, uh, from Porth across to Cumbran, we've got a very radial network. Um, we've got um, services coming in from the heads of the valleys to Cardiff. We've got to deliver more capacity on those services. And by 2023, the end of, that's when the, next, the phase of Metro is going to be operating or early 24, that's when we'll see the capacity uplift. We need to then think about what happens next. And for me, it's providing some cross-regional connectivity. We've got the Cardiff Crossrail as a proposal for the next 10 years. That will do a lot for Cardiff. But across the region, more connectivity between valleys. So what we need to be developing is not a rail network and a bus network. It's a grid, a joined up grid, so that the user then forgets the need to, I don't care if it's a bus or a train, we, we unify the pricing and the zones. We have a single app, a single ticket, and we join up physically and emotionally rail and bus. So that, you know, if I'm in uh, Caerphilly, I'm going to go to Merthyr, I'll hop up to Estramonach, get a cross-valley service across to Aberconan or Quakers Yard, and be up in Merthyr. Today, that journey, 99% of the time, will be in a car. And these are the kind of things we need to do. So developing that grid network, and that's difficult in a world where bus operators have worked on their own networks because of due regulations since the 1980s. You've got a franchise rail operator, which we now have a lot more influence over. They just planned rail networks. We need that holistic transport planning where you think about people's journeys and less about the mode. And I think we're moving towards that. So I'm quite optimistic that in the next 10 years, we're going to see a lot more once the next phase of Metro is delivered in a couple of years. Thanks, Mark. Hugh, I know you want to come in on that, but could you also just let us know, please, about where we are on this integrated ticketing challenge? Um, 
well, I don't think that's a question for me, Oriel, because I think that's, um, you know, that's TFW's bag. But I think I would say the creation of Transport for Wales does give the opportunity, and I, and I laughed when this was first mentioned uh, in, in this discussion, because I remember <clears throat> when I, um, back in the day, worked for, for Sustrans, and this was uh, at least six years ago, getting asked the question about when are we going to get integrated ticketing? And, and six years on, you know, I, I don't think we're a whole lot, lot closer, but the creation of Transport for Wales um, you know, uh, on a model similar to what they've got in Greater Manchester and, and in London, uh, at least gives the infrastructure for that type of uh, system to be introduced. The point I was going to make in response to Neil's question is, um, you know, if he's looking for a specific example, and I, I, I hear what Mark is saying about active travelling in Cardiff, and, and we'll do our bit, don't worry, Mark. But the example I was going to point to was the, um, the Cardiff Parkway uh, in St. Melons, which Yes, it does have a considerable um, yeah, parking dimension to it, specifically to unlock park and ride. And you know, off the back of that, you'd be having seven minute journeys into Cardiff, seven minute journeys into Newport, connected to the road network as well. So people are able to come in there, park up and, and finish you know, the last mile sustainably, as well as with the Cardiff um, Crossrail, you know, stop off on various points through the city, you know, in in Rumney, in 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 Splot, down down in the bay, and then and then beyond out to the west, in a way that's you know just just simply not not feasible at the moment. Um, and in terms of track, most of that track already exists, uh, you know, as as railway designated land. You just need to get that station built with you know with a business park around it, um, and then you can also start implementing you know what's in the Burns Commission in an eastward direction as well as as in a westward direction. So. Um, you know, that, that's where if I had to choose a, a particular, um, you know, area that could be a game changer in the coming two, three years, it would be there. Thanks. And I know about the sort of transport for Wales thing around ticketing, but it's good for to reminding everybody else about that. But thank you. I'm going to, there's a question here from Gwyneth Stroud um, I want to pick up on, which is particularly apposite at the moment uh, for women right across the UK. And it, and it relates to personal safety. I've broken my, my normal rule at events. I've just reminded myself of that. I normally take um, a question from a woman first um, at these sorts of things. I haven't done it online, actually. I've just noticed that I haven't, because then you get more questions from women during the course of uh, the uh, discussion in person. I don't know if it works uh, online, too. But I'm going to come, Christine, to you and Alison about both of these, um, about this issue. Gwyneth's um, very clear that that, that final 10 minute walk in the dark back home on a winter evening from the bus stop to the house at say 10 o'clock is what puts her off and I can totally appreciate that what what can we do what can we do about that in particular yeah you know, we, we certainly need to look at ways to increase uh, personal safety for women you know lighting um, is absolutely key in that I think um, you know, I noticed at my rail station that the accessible route, so, you know, the one that the more vulnerable users are going to be using um, is not lit, but the underpass with the steps that is lit all, all night. So, um, yeah, you know, we, we definitely have to increase that. Um, at Sustrans, we're looking at ways we can get more women helping us to audit the pass so that we can, you know, raise uh, more awareness. We can identify better kind of what the safety issues are. Um, I'm going back to the previous question, and, and I think it does relate to this a little bit as well, actually, is, you know, I think there's a great opportunity in micro mobility um, in kind of, you know, electric bikes and electric scooters um, and whatever else will be developed, you know, similar to both of those, maybe some sort of combination of the two in the future. Um, you know, there's no e-scooter pilot in Wales right now, but the ones that are happening in England seem to be going quite well um, and I think e-scooters will come to Wales so you know perhaps that will um, you know that could help it certainly helps with first and last mile journeys perhaps it helps women to feel more safe because they're able to be on a mode of transport that allows them to sort of keep moving and get away quickly if that is what they need. If they're, if they're on their own not if they're carrying small children and, and packages. Alison two questions there for, for you to pick up on in terms of that personal safety aspect and then the scooter micro mobility one please. Yeah I think I think we may have lost Alison temporarily. We'll see um, if we can come back to her. Um, Ellen, maybe you could uh, see about that. Um, there's a question for um, around buses that I want to come to now. And a question from Josh Miles, who I know has just taken up a new, a new role. Um, 
what role does the panel see for buses in the region? So lots of focus on metro and trains, but bus is still by far the most used mode of public transport. How are we investing in bus priority measures? I guess, Hugh, that's one for, for you initially in terms of um, buses coming into the city. And then Mark, I'll come to you in terms of across the region, please. Well, in the budget that um, kind of council passed uh, earlier this month, there is um, the, the unlocking of a, a total of £13 million of investment going into Cardiff Bus, which is probably the, the, the biggest investment that the council's ever put into the company uh, to do a, a whole load of different things, including modernisation, but in particular to enable it to um, acquire a, a fleet uh, you know, a, 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 of, of electric bus vehicles, um, you know, to be able to provide you know, clean, green, uh, cheap to run uh, buses for, for the people of the city. Alongside that, then there is an ongoing programme of um, installing bus lanes uh, across the city. Um, we, we talked earlier about, about political choices. Um, let me tell you, these, these are not um, decisions without political pain, uh, particularly when you are removing um, car parking, um, you know, on street car parking for residents um, and putting in a bus lane instead. But, but I think it's the right thing to do and expect to see more of it. Um, the, the white paper talks about, uh, you know, a, a much broader strategy of um, um, either site, uh, either bus lanes specifically or even um, bus rapid transit, you know, so, so dedicated uh, lanes like they've got in, in, in Cambridge, which, which, you know, are only accessible um, by bus, connecting um, towns and villages in the region uh, into, uh, into the city. So, uh, you know that that's that's the aspiration beyond um, the, the, the city boundary for there. Um, you know we need to work with with regional colleagues to um, to make a reality of that. Thanks. Great to have Alison back. I'm going to come to you in a, in a minute for those questions, Mark. In terms of that kind of cross regional issue around buses, just just quickly on buses, people don't really realise if you're operating a bus on a congested road with some traffic, to maintain the frequency of service, you're going to need more buses because they're moving more slowly. And therefore, you deliver a less attractive service. If you can provide some segregation so buses can move more quickly, the most important thing is you reduce the number of vehicles you require. Therefore, you reduce your operating costs. At the same time, you make it more attractive for people to use it and you increase your demand. I mean, it's, it's such a no brainer to provide more bus segregation. It's, fr it's kind of bizarre that we haven't done more. It's even more bizarre that some local authorities in some parts of the UK have removed bus lanes. <laughs> when, when the data is that the maths is so unequivocally clear, more bus priority less bus, less cost, more people use it. And going back to the other point, the challenge we've got is the most important aspect of Metro. So there's a big upgrade being delivered in December, 2023, the tram trains, the tri-modes, higher frequency, more capacity at the valleys. The biggest opportunity is integrating and redesigning bus networks to integrate with that, all the way up from Merthyr in Pontypris, across Cardiff, so that we deliver a much bigger single network. That will begin to turn the dial in terms of attractiveness, because you can get from more points um, to origin points to destination points and that that's the challenge and the opportunity thanks thanks mark alison can i come back to you about that safety and e-scooter double question please yeah it actually sort of relates to what was just being said about um segregation weirdly as i think as christine said um lighting and as i said before this linkage of of routes so that the routes are the most obvious and and populated i mean we've got to think about if we're going back to this idea if if we think about all these connections as being places unto themselves and design them so that the services and the activities and the things are all linked up, then chances are they will be more active more of the time. And then we can think about things like lighting and, and, and getting people, and as Christine also said, you know, getting people on the design side who represent um, a wider spectrum of people who are differently abled, who are 95 centimeters tall. Um, and, and, and so, you know, we get a different viewpoint and I think that'll help us design safer spaces. I mean Karis also asked in the chat something about making places safe for, for, for pedestrians when there's so many cyclists and I think that it kind of all these questions sort of link up because as Mark was just saying with buses segregation will help. It's the one place in urban design where, where it makes sense is some segregation of different modes and speeds of traffic um, if we have designated cycle paths where we can and, and clear priority um, in our laws and rules and our design of our systems so that we have the pedestrians having the right of way more often, it makes the whole thing, you know, 
a, a bit a bit safer. It makes um, it makes the whole route more logical, more safe. And and I think that we've got to get more people, uh, a more diverse group of people, out looking at these spaces. Okay, let's um, let's change tack a bit. Um, there's a question in from somebody who hasn't given their name talking about goods movement. Mm. So let's let's pick up on what role do you see as the panel for freight and logistics in the region to contribute to net zero, thinking both about for local distribution and significant growth in vans, in particular with e-commerce, with the deliveries of online shopping and for longer haul, including access to and from ports. Mark, can I come to you for um, that one? Okay, I'm going to be provocative as well, firstly. Go I think for it. One of the problems we have in our society is that we're now so used to being able to buy whatever we want, whenever we want, from whatever we want, at a click of a button. And we've created this proliferation of supply chains for stuff that actually nobody needs, that they think they want, that actually within a few months has either been thrown away or replaced. And it, there's, there's, a, there's a complete perversity in this world we've created of consumerism where there's just a huge amount of energy, time, resource, and logistics tied up in moving tat around. I'm sorry. We, we, so the first thing again, let's, let's ask some serious questions about what we're buying and why. Then let's look at logistics. And I do think, you know, one of the conversations people say to me, let's get all the freight on the railways. Well, I go, well, notwithstanding the point there's too much freight, the stuff you move on railways is, is big, heavy, dirty stuff. Aggregates, fuel, biomass, nuclear waste. A lot of the other stuff we move around is going from many places to many places and doesn't actually suit railways. When you're delivering a, you know, your white van man in Paul, so you're not going to really get that on rail. So uh, my sense on electrify, electrifying um, transport is electrifying white van man, um, because whatever happens, and even if, if we reduce consumerism, we need to be able to decarbonize that fleet. Um, people then say, oh, well, what about trams? You can't get freight on trams. But you know, there are perfectly good viable tram train technologies with freight. So you can have freight trams. So even with the Valley Lands converted to tram train or maybe later de-designated, looking at more suitable um, scaled uh, freight capacity on the rail network. But I gotta go back to the first point. We, 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 we're always trying to solve the problem we've got rather than remove the problem and ask ourselves different questions. The world we are going into, the climate emergency, the consumerism, the degradation of the natural resources, the blatant wastage, plastic wrapping, cardboard boxes, that's got to stop. They're the things we need to change first. Then we can solve the problem that's left. And I think everyone's saying, let's electrify this, let's make that easier, let's move it more efficiently. Let, we've got to change what we do as a society in a very fundamental way. And the externalities of our, our economy... And I've just read a book, um, I'm surprised it took me so long to find it, the, the Donut, Donut Economics, Kate Rayworth. You're late to the party on that one, Mark. Yeah, it's a big, it's a massive problem. We've got to change it. Thank you. Um, Hugh, uh, Christine, I'll, I'll come to you in a tick, Hugh, but Christine first. Um, yeah, thanks, Royal. So um, my next event tonight is um, an e-cargo bike event, um, and we're going to be delivering um, e-cargo bike projects in uh, a couple of towns and cities in Wales um, forthcoming. So, yeah, you know, that's got to be a big part of the solution. In the Netherlands, um, DHL use e-cargo bikes for 60% of their light freight in the city. Um, so loads of opportunities there. I think we really need to have a big push on that. Okay, thank you, Hugh. We need to be solving the challenges of the future. There's a question here from Beard Sturk, which is, you know, in terms of commuting, do we expect it to return to pre-COVID levels or will work from home and order online with the, with the caveats that Mark has set out for us there? Are they here to stay? Will transport use and demand therefore reduce, change in nature and be spread much more across, across the day? What, where are you going with it? <laughs> I mean, I wish I wish I knew what the answer to this would be, and uh, I, you know, I'd have a very clear idea of what to do with Cardiff and also how to uh, <laughs> in, invest in the stock market. Um, as I said earlier, um, Weird, I think there will be significant groups of people who previously relied on public transport who will continue to need to rely on it, and so we have to provide for them no matter what. Um, beyond that, you know, in terms of um, office workers, let's say, people who are currently working from home. Um, my, my best guess is that we are looking at a, at, a, at a hybrid future where people, you know, will choose to come into the office two, three, maybe even four days a week. 
uh, and we'll choose to work from home uh, on, on other days of the week. And I think that's probably um, okay and potentially uh, unlocks the, the best of both worlds. Um, because, you know, from the council's perspective, one of the things we really want to be able to do is, is protect the vitality of the city centre. And there are 70,000 jobs in, in, in the city centre, um, you know, tens of thousands of those, um, you know, working in, in retail and hospitality who probably, you know, rely on the, 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 the spend from, from the other workers as, as well as, as visitors. Um, but you can imagine a scenario where you're coming to the office uh, in, in the city centre, say, three days a week, um, and you might buy a coffee um, from, from the coffee shop on, on those three days. Um, if you were coming in five days a week, uh, and you know, I, I speak for myself in, in this context, I wouldn't buy a coffee five days of the week. But if you can maintain that similar level of spend, um, but with, with less demand across the week uh, on, on the, the road infrastructure and the transport infrastructure, that seems to me to be, um, you know, the the the, the optimum balance. Um, but but yeah, in terms of where I think um, we will end up, uh, I think there will be a degree of return to work, uh, you know, in in offices. Um, but I think, as as Oriol was saying uh, early on, I think people um, have enjoyed the flexibility and and the better, um, you know, balance of life that, that 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 gives them. I think one of the one of the question, the big questions for cities. Um, you know, cities like Cardiff and, and bigger ones and smaller to, to, to get their heads around is what is the future in terms of where where people live? Um, and, you know, there, there seems to be a trend, isn't there, from, um, you know, the, the, the articles I'm seeing for, for more people to live uh, in, in the countryside. Now, potentially, that is going to lead to a renaissance uh, in, in our countrysides. Um, but it could also, you know, lead to exacerbating the problems of the affordability of housing within uh, within those areas, um, for, you know, the attractiveness of cities is that um, you know diversity of you know cultural attractions, um, the restaurant, the different restaurants you can go to, and I think that will continue to be uh, attractive. Is there a space for cities of the size of Cardiff to be attracting workers who previously had to? had to be based in in the southeast of england to now uh, you know live at live and work here and, and contribute to the economy uh, in, in that way I, I i don't know the answer to that but it's certainly some of the things that we are trying to work out and, and looking to bring forward um uh, as, as part of um you know our work on renewal how do we um you know continue to protect the vitality of the city um and you know and and, and the jobs that, that our residents are currently working in thank you hugh there's um it kind of the nice segue into a question from Lucy Baker, which is how recreation and access to green space is fitting into plans for decreasing car use, because it's part of that mix, isn't it, in terms of where people choose to live. Um, I just want to give a shout out to Understanding Welsh Places, which is a tool that the IWA has developed um, from a well-being perspective, looking at um, the assets that places in Wales have with uh, more than 2,000 inhabitants in, in them. Um, and how people make choices as to where, where they live and where they work and what options therefore are, are open to them. I guess there's a question, and um, Christine, I'm going to come to you, that sort of, you know, one of the things we've all experienced, um, or many of us have experienced, is, is a, a much, is an increase in sort of the, the daily walk and discovering the, you know, the places around where we, where we are, which we didn't necessarily see before because we either drove past it or we're in a hurry to get from A to B. Um, is that a sort of soft pedal into understanding and realizing that actually you can do active travel in a different way for for when things are quote unquote normal again and do you see signs of commitment from the council to improve access to areas that are popular for leisure walking by by public transport as a as a as a kind of uh kind of sliding into that understanding and realization that yet yes, yes this is possible and i can do this actually go a slightly different way and be talking about you know green in town centers how do we create more green space for people um you know close to home so you know of course you know access uh to green space places you go that is important 
um you know we we know lots of people have enjoyed being able to um you know connect with nature outside and experience you know the calming effects and the health benefits that that brings to us um but yeah you know as well as being able to go somewhere and access that we would like that to be part, very much part of our communities um and you know looking to sort of green town centers um and making them you know nice and healthy places for people to spend their time the both and I think because I think we'd certainly would agree with you there. I'm conscious of I'm conscious of time. There are three comments and questions that we're we're not going to get to. One is from Juan Subilaga, which is about um, the challenge being urban sprawl, but efforts to increase density in Cardiff lately have resulted in the building of an excess of student accommodation and middle to high income flats. So how how do we address this? Um, a comment from Sophie Jones, which is how is Metro planning to cater and be inclusive for the growing elderly population and decrease car use amongst that particular part of our, our, our demographics? And then obviously with the political um, elections on the horizon, with the UK government setting out its intention to go ahead with the M4 relief road, whereas the first minister here had ruled it out as a sustainable solution. Um, there was a question about what impact would the relief road have on the solutions that you would set out. I shall leave you all hanging on, on, on that one. I suspect that um, people on the panel would generally agree with, um, uh, with the decision that is there at the moment. I want to, I want to bring together some themes and, and some calls of action really from, from today's discussion, which as we reflected at the beginning has been a long time in the making because originally we'd planned this for a year ago and then obviously the pandemic has, um, has happened and other priorities uh, took precedence. Climate change is real. We need to keep saying this. We need to do something about it, not talk about it. And a large part of that is changing our relationship with car use. We need fewer cars and not just newer electric cars. We need to evolve the way in which we plan transport. We need to plan the way we travel in order to meet our decarbonisation targets rather than the other way around. We need to do more than just meet decarbonisation targets though. We need to send the message that roads are for more than just for cars, they are for people people in all sorts of different ways, living their lives in all sorts of different ways and all sorts of different parts of the population at different stages of their lives as well, depending on what their roles and responsibilities are. We need a transport network that works for everyone as, and is inclusive for everyone, for everyone. And the way in which we make that happen is through involving different types of people at different stages in their lives in the design process. This seems to me self-evident. The biggest challenge though, is how we design our urban environment in order to make it easy and natural for people to get around in a sustainable way. I may be teaching my misrector grandmothers to suck eggs, but these truths need repeating. Thank you very much indeed to everybody who has joined the discussion today. Really pleased to see so many people here. I'd like to thank our panelists for giving us their time. Thank you to Mark Barry, to Christine Boston, to Alison Dutrois and Councillor Hugh Thomas. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to Cardiff University and Cardiff Council for supporting this event. Um, as usual, to get advance notice of all IWA events, you will not do any better than joining us as a member and you can do that at the link which is in the chat. Seamless teamwork from behind the scenes. Thank you very much indeed everybody. Bang on the button at five o'clock because we always finish on time. Thank you and good afternoon. <laughs>